Fear and competition can be your best friend. Season three of the Little Bricks podcast is back. (laughs) We've got some amazing guests. Can't wait for you to see them. We're going to be speaking mental health, addiction, recovery, sales, business, sports, all sorts of topics. Distraction kills dreams. The people you spend time with, you will become. Tough times don't ever last, but tough people do. I cannot wait to share it with you. This week's episode of the Little Bricks podcast is sponsored by Bespoke Financial Group, the UK's number one life insurance broker, helping protect your little bricks too. Morning, George. Welcome to the Little Bricks podcast, mate. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Good morning. Absolute pleasure, mate. Thank you so much for jumping on. I've been going back and forth for a few weeks now, mate, so I appreciate you making time. Bright and early on a Sunday morning, mate. Uh, means a lot because... One of the people I was desperate to have a chat with when we did season three, so thank you. No problem, no problem. Super. So, George, obviously, Cage Warriors champion from Middlesbrough. It's quite a unique story. Um, Your career, your trajectory is going one way, but I'd love to learn more about how did you become, you know, an MMA champion? Where are you based from, mate? What, what part of Teesside are you from? Tell us a bit about your story, please, mate. So I'm from a bit in Teesside called Normanby, you know, and uh, like Normanby, Eston, where trained at uh, Linthorpe, Linthorpe Village, where Middlesbrough Fight Academy is. Now, I don't have any, like, amazing story. That's the thing. I don't have, you know, a lot of fighters, they say, I got into fighting because I was flat broke, or I got into fighting because... I was getting bullied. I don't have any like mad inspirational story or anything. I was just 12 years old at one point and thought, you know, I'm just playing the video games. I'm just playing on the PS2 for like five hours when I get in from school. It's like, mm, I know that's not quite right. I have to do something. So there was like a Thai boxing gym, literally like five minute walk down the road, uh, Teesside Muay Thai. Started training there, training there with Ken. And it, it was literally just, I really like it. I don't think, Every time you need some big convoluted reason, like there has to be an inspirational story, just start because you like it. And over the whole time I've been training, it's just, it's not been a, a case of some great motivation. It's just, I massively enjoy it. I massively enjoy training, training with my brother. It's my favorite yeah. thing in the world. So I started T side Muay Thai, just doing T side. Cool, I really love it. Doing a, Muay Thai fights, junior Muay Thai were- fights until the age of 15. And that's when I jumped across into MMA. You know, you know what, mate? I really appreciate how open and honest you are there because I think you're right. I think with most success stories, especially from a town from Middlesbrough, and I think fighting gets, because it's still within its infancy as a sport, I believe, you know, MMA. Uh, it gets linked to boxing a lot. And historically, we always heard of boxers coming from nowhere been down in the gutter, this was my last chance. And that rocky leg story that we've seen so many fighters, you know, to take that route. But I think more and more now, mate, in most sports, um, certainly in fighting as well, you see people, it's quite cool just to say, no, I don't have that story. Coming from, you know, a, a nice family, um, no rocky story behind me. Unfortunately, we don't have, or fortunately, we don't have one, all have one of them. And, um, do you think that actually helps the mindset of a fighter? Do you think you need like a rocky story? Do you think it adds a lot more stability and mental strength for someone? I've seen Devin Haney, the boxer, and he comes from quite a privileged background. And he's also a Muslim, which I didn't I didn't realise until after the fight. But I actually think that helps his mindset, you know, that having his father coming from a really um stable, privileged background, you know. I think um you know, there's some people can have that fire from that motivation or whatever, but I just do it because I massively enjoy it. And, you know, I've, if you watch any of my fights, I've not had a a sign of quitting any fights. It's not like that's been needed to build any kind of toughness. I build that through training. It, it's, you know, people find all these different extraneous sources of motivation. I just do it because I really enjoy it. It's like the only way I, I use to motivate myself is I watch some fights. Oh, I enjoy that. I kind of want to replicate it. Yeah, I get that, mate. I really do. I think with motivation, quite contradictory for anyone who knows me, 
But I think I'm learning quite a lot that motivation's great, but it's a bit like a can of Red Bull. What goes up must come down. It only lasts for a short period of time, right? Um, it's got to be something that's really intrinsic and something that you're really passionate and um, inspired by to sort of find, to dig deep at them moments. And you're absolutely right, mate. And for anyone who's seen your last fight, fuck me, that there's not one milligram of quitting you. Like, that was unbelievable. One of the best fights I've ever seen in my life. Cheers, mate. Cheers, mate. It was like... That's the thing when you're in tough fights, though. I think it's all due to your preparation. It's not... Maybe, maybe it's not some, like, extra Rocky movie thing where you look in the crowd and you see someone and you hey, I'm motivated now. It's... It's kind of my head thinking one thing, but yeah. your body just reacts based on how you've prepared for weeks and months and months and years. It's like, uh, I remember in the first round, because I was just expecting takedowns, takedowns, and then he blasts me with these straight punches and my nose is gushing. I have to like spit blood out my throat because it's like cloyed up in my throat and I need to breathe, so I spit it out on the floor. And I remember thinking at that point, he's a wrestler and I'm the striker and I'm getting embarrassed on the feet here. But... The thought's there, but there's no, like, physical manifestation of the thought because I'm just going on, like, autopilot due to how yeah. I've prepared for years. Yeah, yeah. So you've sort of, like, programmed in your next move. It's sort of totally, totally, totally ingrained in your sort of DNA and thought process. To be quite, is it, like, quite instinctual at that point, George? Yeah, it's, it's pure instinct. It's weird how, like... Sometimes what's going on in your head and what's going on in your body and your actions are like completely different things. Hmm. Do you think though, because you see quite a lot of sports, you see certain fighters, um, certainly from boxing, for example, but I think it's quite relatable and transferable to life. I think certain people have certain character traits, both assets and, and character flaws or defects of character, should we call it, for the sake of the conversation. And I do believe that without really severe training, we will always revert to type at some point. I, I genuinely believe that I'm out of heart. I think, yeah, I think they can... There's a good argument for, like, people having traits, people having more, uh, like, naturalistic tendencies. But that being said, I think everyone's favourite fighter at the minute, or every, every fighter's favourite fighter at the minute, is Charles Oliveira. And yeah. if you watch his last few fights, he's going back and forth in wars. He's getting knocked down and then getting straight back up and knocking them down. It's And it's complete opposite to his early career. His early career, he's been like, he's tweaked his shoulder and he's dropped down. He's took a few body shots and he's dropped down. And he, it's interesting because he has quit in previous fights. Right. But now it's completely different. I think there's, there's, there's a lot of like pliability to people's character. Right. But that can only be changed through like really intense situations and long times of preparation. Yeah, I understand that. I think, um, who's the trainer last year, George? Diego Sanchez trained away at hang upside down. Oh, and Fabian. <laughs> anyway, Self awareness guy. Is that right? So, what's that trainer called there where he's beating him with a stick and sort of like trying to realize the trauma or? Um, well, I think in the case of Fabia, that kind of training's called exploitation because he was a weird, <laughs> weird sort of guy. I don't think you have to hang up that upside down getting hit with a stick because if you train in MMA, it's, you're getting beaten up <laughs> already enough. Yeah, yeah. You just need it to be the right way technically and the right way um, yeah. preparing for the fight situation. It's like one of the most horrendous things. Me and Harry do it in training. We get everyone preparing for a fight to do it in training. We need a, a cooler name for it, but we just call it position pads. And it's it's probably the most grueling aspect of the training. It doesn't last like ages. It lasts as long as the fight, really. So say my last fight, I was preparing to fight a wrestler. So I was preparing to defend takedowns, get up off the floor. So mm -hmm. what I do is a minute and a half, just get fresh people to like put me down in a bad position. Like I'm on my back and side control or the mount me. I've got to escape as many times in that minute and a half. If it gets to the end of the minute and a half and I'm not up, just pause the timer because I don't want to be looking at the timer thinking, oh, I'll just, I'll just be up in 20 seconds. Yeah. So I've just got to get up and up as, much, as many times as possible. 
as soon as that's finished, there's another minute and a half. Now I'm blasting the pads as hard as I can, completely emptying the tank. Do that. And then a minute and a half, again, I'm defending takedowns. They put me on the fence, like the most horrid, grueling positions. And then I blast the pads again for a minute and a half. So it's like a six minute round. And then I yeah. do that for five rounds with Brilliant. fresh guys swapping in. And it's just, it just, it brings your body to a point of just fatigue and you kind of redlined, but you get comfortable with that over the time. I mean, you never get truly, truly comfortable, but it just gets you used to moving and uh, working constantly, yeah. despite yeah. being in the most horrendous situation physically. I, I think that does enough for you. I don't think you need to like <laughs> do Joshua uh -huh. Fabius hanging upside down, getting hit with a stick. Yeah. I think for the, for anyone who listens to the show when it goes live, Fabio was a trainer. He had a like a, a human bat hanging down from the sky, and he was just literally hitting him with a stick, getting used to trauma. But I think this in Conor McGregor actually half defends the strategy to a degree, saying that he actually believes in is it like trauma, you know, like creative trauma, a controlled trauma training, whatever whatever tag he gave it. I think I think there's some uh, there's some merit to you know conditioning your body, but you get so much of that just doing mm. Muay Thai rounds and clinching and yeah. smashing pads and grappling, yeah. and getting fresh fresh people taking you down and like slamming you on the mat all the time. Yeah. I think you kind of get enough of that. Yeah, without <laughs> without hanging upside down like a bat. Yeah, yeah I don't fancy that. Yeah, um, we um we now in our my job, I'm a salesman, I sell life insurance, right, George? It's complete opposite end of the spectrum, right? To your profession, right? You use our professional, trained, I might I don't mean to sound offensive here, but you're trained, skilled MMA professionals, right? You kill us. With us though, the hardest thing that we have to do is pick up the phone, believe it or not, and make a phone call. I said, George, I want to sell you some life insurance because you know what making a phone call would do? It will absolutely highlight all of your vulnerabilities and insecurities. Any salesperson or anybody who's ever worked in sales for a living and that I pick up the phone, the, the nervousness, the anxiety, the sickness, the nausea, you know, right, mate, it's, it's absolutely vile. But the only way to beat out that fear, or not even beat it out, but it's still there for me 13 years later, and I've... I've I've made more phone calls than any any other life insurance agent in the UK, mate. But it just you become a little bit trained and a little bit resilient to it. That makes sense. You program yourself up here spiritually, physically, everything, just to know that this is my job. This is what I need to do to get that result. I think there's a lot of things that are really relatable to fight, and I genuinely do. Certain things I watch and I think, like hanging on when you, when things aren't going your way. You know, just seeing the round out. Um, does that make sense in any way? Like things that you are so transferable for life to from 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 sport, whether it be boxing, MMA, whatever it is, to, to life. I genuinely think there's so much business people, life in general, we can take from sport. Yeah, and especially I think with a yeah, because like as an example here, you know, fighting looks like this dead tough thing, but it's just over repetition over years and years, like. For me to make a call and try and sell something would be the most stressful thing. And like, yeah. Whereas getting in a fight, I've taken a few punches to the face. That's when I'm most comfortable in an odd way. <laughs> it's, like, yeah. it, it's like, if I go to a fight, it's a big thing, a title fight, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. As soon as like punches start getting exchanged, that's where I'm most comfortable, really. If it took me to a social, even like a, a more chilled social event, like a wedding or something, I would I'd be pretty nervous, like meeting all these people I don't know. I'd be more nervous attending a wedding and having to mingle and chit-chat than I would be fighting. No way. It's like, because I'm, you know, I'm comfortable like teaching, I'm comfortable fighting, I'm comfortable doing interviews and stuff, stuff that I'm practiced in. But other than that, I'm, I'm more of like a, like a nerdy type. You know, it's like, if I've got my own spare time, I'm going to play some video games and stuff. So I'll get more nervous for these kind of mingly, quite usual social situations than I would for a fight. It's all dialed in where a fight is a really comfortable thing now. It's like, 
it's not like I get in the cage and then the pressure like doubles and triples. That's yeah. actually the moment of relief getting in the cage. Wow. It's, it's like everything's done. It's all up to the preparation. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah, that's the point you get to see. Yeah. Well, I remember watching, I watched your fight. I've got to be honest, I think I, I might get in trouble with this one, but I watched it through a mutual friend, Jamie Tillers. I think he did a Facebook Live and I was watching it through that. And um, we'd never met. But I get that same, especially if it's someone from the borough. But you know, really big fights for it, just for a fan. The nauseating, I'm up and down, nail biting. Any big fight that goes on, that fear and that anxiety that you know, big fights give me. I remember, I think McGregor Mendez won. Obviously, I was you know McGregor before before the May with the money. I was such a fucking huge fan. And it, it, more than sport, really, mate. It was more of a mindset thing. It, he, he introduced me to law of attraction, visualization, manifestation, thinking things into existence, etc. You know, confidence. Because confidence was always an issue for me because I did struggle myself. Um, but yeah, the fear we get, you know, as fans watching you, is thinking, uh, you don't get that. Do you get that at all? Night? Any butterflies? You get butterfly and butterflies and nerves. But the thing is about them is like when. I first started, I thought, well, you've got to crush them down. You've got to uh, control them, whatever, you, whatever. You. But yeah. the more you do that, the more you fatigue yourself, I think. Yeah. yeah. Whereas yeah. if you just let them happen, they yeah. produce the best results. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, probably, it's probably different for some people. Some people probably get too many nerves and are way up there. But yeah. I just go through the, the process of enjoying the nerves because you don't get that kind of feeling. Yeah. As much the nerves I can't enjoy is when I'm cornering my brother. That's like ten times, ten times worse. He'll say the same thing because you know you're kind of in the outside seat. You're seeing it a bit more. You're not, you're not physically involved in that way. I think where you're nervous, but you're physically involved in the fight. I think yeah. it's more. It just feels like a more like naturally synchronized situation, isn't it? So. You know, you, you're ramping up. It's like your sympathetic nervous system or whatever you call it. And then your body's moving as well. It's kind of, it's it's synchronized a bit. When you're cornering, you get that ramp up in nerves, but no physical release of it. You're not, yeah. you're not getting warmed up. You're not trading, you're not trading punches. And then after a fight, whatever the result is, uh, you've had that physical release. It's all matched. It's It's kind of like a natural balance. When you've cornered, it it's not gone anywhere. You've been sat in the corner shouting. Yeah. You've not had that physical release. So I like like Harry's last fight in Belfast was a really stressful one. He fought an undefeated lad from Italy. And Harry got dropped two times the second time, was really bad in the first round. But then still got up and slammed the guy yeah. and was beating the guy up for two rounds and ended up being a draw. Probably should have edged towards Harry, but it ended up being a draw. I I remember just the physical feelings after the fight. Because like, it's not gone anywhere. I had to go in like the back room and shadow box and jump yeah. around just to kind of yeah. like... Yeah. Do you, get, do you think like... like I, I'm an addict in recovery, right, George? So for me, um, I don't know enough about addiction as of yet. I'm not sure if anything's I've ever been improved, whether that's something you're born with or like most things, something that you pick up along the way, whatever it may be, right? Do you think there's something there with sports people, what you've just described there, where they stop getting that um, platform to sort of release not just their energy, but that that social anxiety, their nerves, that, that you know, that in, them insecurities and vulnerabilities, which any form of sport, especially the one that you're, you're doing, because you're saying, like, you know, so many different sports people, the stop sport, and literally they put weight on, and so many go down that track. I mean... My addiction kicked in in my early 20s. I stopped playing football at 27. I would never compare football to what you do. But the minute I stopped playing football, mate, bang, that that disease of addiction, it, it, it grabbed me by the throat and choked the life out of me to the point where it should have killed me. And I do believe that certain things being taken out of my life, structure, being part of a team, um physical exercise and endurance, testing myself. and co I think competition is really important for human beings as well, or some of us. I don't know what your thoughts are with that. 
I think, yeah, I think it's just the whole package of competition, isn't it, as well? Because, you know, even in MMA, which you think, well, it's a, a one-man sport. It's you against your opponent. It's not a team sport. There's just there's that huge social aspect to it. And I take it for granted because I'm in the gym like twice a day. I'm training with people. I'm teaching classes. I'm doing all sorts. And then I take it for granted. And then if I'm out the gym for like two or three days, like after a fight, there's, I feel like there's a loss. In the, hang on. I think some volume's gone. I th- but um, there's a there's a loss in that interaction. You get like those little highs off of the, off of every part of the process. Like just having a bit of crack with uh, your training partners before the session. There's like that little physical high of training and then finishing the session. Obviously, sparring is a pretty big one or like the equivalent, like playing a match. There's all these little things come together to kind of give you a really big social and physical high. And if that's gone, I can see how people like need to fill that void. You said about video games. Um, not, obviously, each one of us have our own things, right? And that's absolutely... What life's all about, right? What what video games mean to you? Is it something that you still play? Is it just something for, from childhood? Something that's really an important part of your life? Well, video games were like huge as a kid. And I kind of think, you know, I've not had like any serious addictions, like alcohol, drugs, whatever. Yet. But I kind of think my vices outside of, you know, my vices are kind of, being things like video games or things like food. So, uh, like, I had a really bad problem when I, when I was a kid. It was like, I had this phase where I'd get home from school and play seven hours of video games and then go to bed. And that was like, and obviously it's not, it's not sustainable or productive, really. Right now, I kind of moved away from playing video games. I actually set my New Year's resolution as play more video games because it was at a point where it used to be you'd go outside for a walk to take a healthy break from playing video games and now it almost feels like you go and play some video games that's a healthy break from social media because it just bombards you with news and pointless info yeah so yeah. My, my new year's resolution was to play more video games this year yeah I can make you know what I can relate the social media thing I don't know, I've gone through different spells. 41-year-old. At some point, I think I read a Grand Cardone book and it said, if you lead a business, and I'm like that as well, I'm quite easy influenced. So I read a Grand Cardone book, it was an American entrepreneur, and you've got to do social media, and I'm thinking, right, if you're running a business, if you're leading a business, you, the, the people talk a lot about brands, certainly in your sport, right? How important is a brand in your sport, George? Well, it's become so huge now. It's like... People aren't just fighters. It's not like like 2005, whatever. You, people were they were just a fighter. And the, just being that alone would be a lot of branding. Whereas now, if you look at all the top fighters, they're pretty much like half fighters, half content creators. Or they've got a content creation team. You know, Paddy's the best example. He's killing it on every social media platform now. YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, or whatever you. It's it's kind of reached this point where, say, Tito Ortiz was talking about it. Back in 2005, there wasn't that many fighters. So just by being a fighter and winning fights, you built your brand up massively. Whereas now it's, there's such a sea of information. You've kind of got to put stuff out there constantly. But it's a hard balance to do. It's hard. It's a hard balance to put stuff out there whilst not getting too sucked into social media to the point where you're living on your phone. Yeah, it's all the game, mate. I, I've fell down that rabbit hole, 100%. Sitting there at night times thinking, what should I post tomorrow? And like, should I say this? And what if we do that? And I'm thinking, hey, what the fuck? Like, you've got kids, you've got a father, you're 41. You've got a business to run, a life to live. One million percent, I, I got addicted to social media and... And probably, you know, I'd be vulnerable enough and, and honest enough to admit, worrying what people actually thought. 
Do you know what I mean? Like I have some obligation to post on a daily basis, which an element of me, an element of me believes that you, you do if you're running a business. You know, I, I, I genuinely believe that no matter what the business may be, because, you know, a, a attraction um, or promotion is important, isn't it? You know, so you talk about um, Paddy there. Are you his friends? Are you? Do you, I know you've trained with each other. Yeah, we've trained with each other a few times. I've been on his, uh, been on his podcast. I've been to like next generation Liverpool to train a few times. And he's just, you know, he's blown up and he's blown up, but he's just a proper sound guy. You know, he's got time for anyone. But yeah, I've, I've trained with him a few times and he's like, he's like the perfect example of how people should kind of do content at this point. But that being said, you know, people were starting to build up content and, and all that. And it was kind of like a big social media following would help people get into the UFC or Bellator, whatever it is. But then there was that time where a lot of Dagestani fighters started to come out the woodwork and they've got no social media. They're just train strict Muslims, train strict Muslims. They're not doing much social media at that point. And there was kind of like a mystique about them. You know, when the Khabibs are coming out and Zabit. Yeah. yeah. So it can kind of work in different ways. Yeah, like no one's talk- really figured it out. Yeah, I get you completely. I think the actual personality and being authentic is important, right? I, I believe so. But then again, it's just subjective, isn't it? What, what each of the likes. You trained with Paddy. Obviously, he's now in the UFC. Is that your ultimate goal for yourself, George, and for your brother Harry? Is that to, to, to be in the UFC? Is that like, you know, utopia? Is that the mecca? Is that the end goal for, for all MMA fighters? Yeah, that's the goal, the UFC. At this point, I'm either one to defend that cage warrior's belt or get into the UFC for the next fight. But, you know, you can never predict what opportunities come up. You can never predict the opportunities. So it's just training and staying ready for the end of the year. I want one more fight this year. Because to me, the first things first is a competitive schedule. That's one of the big reasons why I didn't hang around for Bellaton. I jumped to cage warriors. I'm like, cage warriors were having events. Constantly, even through the pandemic, constantly. That's what I want is I'm a competitor first. And then where it is kind of kind of came second. So it's like, uh, you know, I want that active schedule of competition. So in my head, I just want one more fight towards the end of the year and then see where we go from there. I don't know which, which promotion, what opportunity, but yeah, the UFC is the goal. The UFC is a goal as well, you know, like when I started training, one of the things that got me into it was playing UFC Undisputed 2009 and uh, playing UFC Undisputed and looking at these people like Shogun Hua. What's his style? It says Muay Thai, BJJ, Muay Thai. I can train Muay Thai down the road and be like Shogun. You go on YouTube and like YouTube's way different back then in 2009. You get these little highlight reels people have made of his of his pride fights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, those three letters, the UFC, it's always been something I want to work for. Do you believe in visualisation and manifesting things? I like, you know, even outside of, uh, you know, some people have, like, different viewpoints in visualisation. If we use visualisation as a word as, like, mental practice, mental imagery, there is, there is like in, into the tens of systematic reviews, meta-analysis, real clinical scientific stuff that finds positive results to mental imagery, mental practice, motor imagery, uh, visualization. It gets put under a lot of different umbrellas. That's one of the things I studied quite a bit in my sports science degree is uh, motor imagery, which, you know, you can get turned into like visualization, mental imagery or what have you. And one of the, the very important things I find with visual, visualization is practicing the bad spots. You know, people want to people wanna visualize themselves achieving something all the time. But I think practice the bad stuff. It almost goes back to like feudal Japan and Bushido, you know, how they, they free themselves up to fight more by thinking of their own death. Yeah like contemplating their own death every day. It's almost like that. If I visualize a fight, I don't think, I don't think of myself smashing someone. I'm often thinking 
putting myself in the worst positions, like thinking to myself, I've been mounted and someone's throwing elbows at me. Just so, oh, I've, be, I've been taken down as soon as I hit the floor, I'm working up. I think that's probably one of the most valuable aspects of visualization for me is visualizing the worst case scenarios and then being comfortable when they happen. I don't like, you know, some people are big on self-talk, but I don't like to self-talk myself. He can't take me down. He can't take me down. And then when they do, they're like, they're shitting themselves because they didn't expect that eventuality. I'm more from the, uh, the mindset of if I get taken down a hundred times, I'm going to get up a hundred times. Yeah, I totally appreciate that, mate. And you spot it. That was fascinating that you just shared that. I really believe in visualization, mental imaging, mental imaging, uh, position yourself where you'd like to be. You're absolutely right. I think positioning yourself in positions you don't want to be and actually openly speaking about that, because I do believe in self-talk, um, it's probably fear-based for me because you, because you talk from so many different books and avenues and platforms. Don't think about bad things because you will think that into existence. So somewhere along the line, I put the shutters up and thought, but then I would challenge any human being to, to say that they don't think about, especially when there's a funeral going on, the Queen's funeral last week, God bless our Queen. Every single person thinks about their own funeral. Everybody thinks they'll be there. What will they say? I wonder who'll turn up. I wonder what song though. I wonder what legacy. Do you understand what I'm saying? So it's natural to actually think them things, but I've actually resisted that temptation and gone, push, like shows up immediately when it happens. But, but you're actually in favour of putting yourself in them unfortunate, difficult, compromising positions. Is that right, George? Yeah, I'll... Just so, you know, you can't walk through the rain and not get wet. It's that kind of thing. I never think he's not going to hit me once or he's never going to be able to take me down. Because if he hits you with a good shot, you kind of like, you can kind of shatter the illusion you've built up sometimes. Whereas I just want to, you know, if someone's, just, as an example, if someone's hit you, they're in range for you to hit them. So you always want to be, working at that exact moment because everything bad that happens to you is an opportunity. If I get slammed under my ass with a takedown, there's that second where I can sweep them or scramble them, scramble up. There's that, that's like the best time to scramble up. If someone slams me on my ass with a takedown, that's the best moment to stand back up when I've just been taken down. And if I spend that time thinking, damn it, wow, I didn't think I would get taken down. Then it's ten times worse because you settled the position, yeah. uh, and I guess, and I guess you you could probably use that for a metaphor as as a lot of other things in life. If you spend that moment when something bad happens to you, thinking, "Damn, like that! I never thought that would happen. It's so annoying." Ah, there's that time accumulates where you're not taking action. I actually agree with you. By the way, I think. It's the books that you read, the narrative that's out there. So, you know, don't think about bad thoughts because thoughts become things. We speak things into existence. And I believe that you probably, you know, people like myself have read them books and listened to that narrative and, and probably programmed themselves to, to be fearful of negative, neg negative thoughts, potential negative outcomes, situations, etc. I think you're probably just choosing a faith-based approach, I guess, you know, that'll be okay in the end and just putting your faith in some form of higher power. Uh, the universe, a god of your understanding, total respect for for that, I guess. But that probably leads into something you said earlier on about Khabib um, and a lot of Muslim fighters, because I think the religion's such a it's such a topic, right, of debate. But I, I do feel that there's so many unbelievably successful and what seem to be mentally strong sports people who've got a really deep faith, religion, um, and so many at the moment who are Muslims, certainly within your profession. Is faith important in sports? And does it help people, you know, achieve their goals? And, and does that make sense? I think, yeah. I, well... A good example is Khabib's uh, recent Hall of Fame induction speech. Because he's of the mind, everything happens through God. He's saying how uh, 
people get successful and then they think I'm successful because I'm really smart. I'm successful because I'm, I'm the hardest worker. He had the kind of mindset of I'm successful because, because God wanted me to be. And that kept him, you know, keeps you grounded because it's never like I did this, I did that. I'm not, I'm not religious myself. I'm, I'm more just kind of agnostic about it. I'm kind of like, you know, I've seen a lot of people trying to be too rationally minded with atheism, but I don't think that's like the most rational because it's like, how do you know? But yeah. then I'm, I'm not like the biggest into organized religion. I think to some extent, if whatever you, you call it, if you have like, you call it like, I don't know, you call it God or you just call it the universe or the cosmos or whatever, whatever you, you say, if you just have something in your head just to say, oh, I'm grateful, thank you. It doesn't have to go anywhere. It's like, does the universe hear it? No one knows. Does a God hear it? No one knows. But if you just get in that habit of just, you know, even when things aren't as good, just saying thank you, no one has to hear it. it can just be, you say it to yourself. You hear it. That's like a definite fact. And I think it's always, you're always at a stronger position when you're grateful for an opportunity. Because then you use it more, don't you? I agree. I totally agree with you. I think step three of the 12 step program is handing over your free will to a God of your understanding. And it doesn't force down God down your throat. And I appreciate not everyone suffers with what I believe a disease of addiction like myself. But it was so powerful for me, George, you know, just being able to hand over my free will because my free will wreaked havoc with my life. I just made bad choice after bad choice after, to the point where I ended up in a room saying I've got an addiction problem and I need some help because I've wreaked total devastation and chaos behind me through my own, my own decision-making process. So I think it really helped me, if nothing else, get some sort of be at home with my heart to be able to say, look, Help and that self-talk narrative, whether it's just internal or I'm externally vocalizing it, just to say, look, help me with this, please. Can 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 just help me do this correctly today. Take this decision away from me because I can't. Because you know what? Sometimes it can be a bit overwhelming, can't it? You know the anxiety creates the responsibility of decision making and people pleasing is a big one for me, man. Really is. That makes sense. Just having to hold on to that anxiety, it's just too much for me. Hence the um the negative outlet. Yeah, just having a the kind of release for it almost, isn't it? Definitely. 100 percent yeah. So who's your greatest, who's your hero? Who's the best fighter of all time, in your opinion, which is such a debated topic? My favorite one that you know I'd I've watched his career over and over and over again is I really like Demetrius Johnson. The, you know, I, he's my goat. The guy with the, the record title defences in the UFC. Please, can we say that again? I'm really sorry, mate. It broke up really bad. My Wi-Fi went off there. I do apologise to interrupt you, mate. Sorry. Um, who's your greatest fighter of all time, please, mate? So my favourite fighter ever is uh, Demetrius Johnson. Well, wow. It's like, I think the way he combines skills, the way he still does, you know, he's just won that one belt. I didn't think he'd beat Marais. I thought Marais had his number. But that was a really inspirational, brilliant fight. I watched Demetrius Johnson's career, like, back and forth, over and over and over again. You know, there's certain... For me, there's certain fighters where, if I'm on a low day, not feeling buzzed with energy, I can watch one of their fights, and I just... And now I'm, like, bouncing around the gym. One of his prime performances... And again, I think there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of good stuff about Demetrius Johnson just when you listen to his interviews because he never got put in as a big personality. He never got that kind of hype like a McGregor would. He's not trash talking, but I find him so interesting to listen to because he's one of the most realist people about when he talks about fights. He's on like the most massive winning streak ever, and. He's not that kind of, I'm the greatest, I'm going to beat everyone and go to 100 no, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> he would, he would, in an interview, he's saying, well, it's competition. You're probably going to lose at some point. Um, 
he was asked about Henry Cejudo taking him down. And do you think Henry Cejudo will take you down? And he's like, probably, because I'm going to be trying to knee him. I'm going to be trying to elbow him. I'm going to be trying to work. So he'll probably take me down. There's no, like, he can't touch me. There's no, like, nonsense to it. He's just a very realist approach to it. That seems to be your approach on life, mate. You said about your visualisation, you do negative, that you got respect for Demetrius Johnson and his outlook. I think Tyson Fury in boxing is quite like that as well. He's like, yeah, Wilder, I was out. Um, he has such a, at times, such a real point of view. I think the Johnson interview recently, he said Khabib would have been defeated if he continued fighting. And I, thought, I agree. Do you? Yeah, I agree 100%. Because uh, Khabib didn't fight at that top level like too much, to be honest. And uh, it's kind of like, I think... If anyone competes long enough, they're going to get beat. It's a weird thing about MMA and boxing, where it's built up into such huge events that you do twice a year, three times a year. What other sports like that? People in other sports are competing like once a week, once every two weeks when they're in the season. They maybe have like 30, 40 games over the year, whatever it is. It's going to happen. You know, you see this in Muay Thai a lot. There was a, a Damien Trainer post about a fighter called Hippie Singmanee, who technically, a lot of people think technique-wise, he was one of the best fighters. But he had a year where he had 20 fights and he only won four of them. But that can kind of happen in Muay Thai, where they're fighting 20 times a year as opposed to two. Whereas like MMA, it's so built up towards these single big events that happen twice a year, once a year for some champions, even less that so much weight is put on that performance. Whereas other sports, you can kind of see like the wave of the form and see how it balances out. You know, like someone who could be considered a great, like hippie Singmani, uh, can have an extended period of bad form. And it kind of gets shown a bit more because he's competing that much. Whereas Khabib didn't have that many, any, that many fights in the UFC. Yeah. Like 12, 13. Yeah, yeah. So you don't see that. So you don't see that. Uh, that establishment of his form throughout his career. There you go. Man. Sorry, my dishwasher's playing up again. <laughs> I'll never do this from home again. Do you think um, like time for me? Time is so important in sport. And listen, mate, like you're an expert, you're a professional in your field, but it seems time it seems to be so important. Um you know when people fight each other exactly at like the right time so Khabib stopped Oliveira's rise, rise from prominence which is the beauty of all sports right um, that sort of power vacuum that we just sort of get that conveyor belt of next 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 and the evolution of what fighting looks like the Oliveira fight would have been interesting with Khabib right oh definitely I think people say now because speaking of form we've seen Tony Ferguson drop off and we saw Khabib have a really strong finish to his career. People don't understand. You know, and people say Khabib, oh, I would just smash Tony Ferguson, no question. People don't understand. They were booked to fight five different times in their career. Each one of those times they were booked to fight each other would have been completely different. That makes sense, yeah. Do you think... So, like, Ferguson's a really interesting point. Sorry to me, I'm, like, UFC geek in that way, but Nate Diaz, who I don't think gets that much respect, really, you know, for so many fighters, it was sort of like, instead of the McGregor fight, it was lucky and fluky. They had such big gaps in between fights. But yeah, people he's fought then since, you know, Leon Edwards was... The damage he took, and the final round was just like... If you sum up Nate Diaz, it'd be the final round. It was unbelievable to watch. And he just beat Tony Ferguson, who, who probably... A few years back, before Ferguson's, I don't want to call it a decline and be disrespectful, but he, he, his losing streak started. He sort of lost his glimmer. You would never, ever, most people would have said, who aren't a professional would have said, yeah, he could never be Tony Ferguson. And it's just amazing, you have to say. I've never seen a sport like it, where a boxing have long undefeated records on for so long, but, but UFC, or MMA, sorry, ain't it crazy how the, the sort of, it, did you get what I'm saying? Like how different styles make different fights and the time of it seems to be they come up and, and people sort of struggle and decline. Yeah, and there's so many factors. Like 
there's so many different styles going into a fight and the, it's so much more chaotic and there's so many more variables. And then outside of that, it's like the weight cuts are so big. It's like uh, if a weight cut goes wrong, that can massively affect people's performance. You know, just just a little thing in the weight cut and the dieting. Injuries as well. They're building up to these big events once, twice a year, three times a year, they're fighting. And then what if they get an injury like two weeks before it? It's like not bad enough to pull out the fight, but it might still affect performance. There's just so many different factors to it. And, it's, and it can just change immediately like that. It's like, say, a football game. If a team is 6-0 up and there's 10 minutes to go, you know, it's not good. it can't just change in the blink of an eye the way fighting can, which is what makes fighting scary, but it also makes it the most exciting sport. Yeah, the most exciting sport. Do you think training with your brother and you and your brother, you seem like best mates as well from the outside looking in, which is lovely, Matt. Has that been important to your career for the Perriers? Massively, massively, massively. Always having that that second person there where I think it's so built in now between me and my brother that there's no question. It's not, oh, should we train? Should we train? That's never even a question that happens because we're always training with each other. We've always got a second person there. We're like, I need to push Harry tonight. He's fighting soon. There's never, ever that question. And it's also just having someone that's completely, 100% honest with you. And you're honest with them. And there's no bullshit. There's no nonsense. There's no questions. You've just got that, that second person there where you're just completely on the same, wa- same wavelength. It's, it's massive, like, it's massive. There's times where I think there was a point where I wasn't going to do MMA again. I thought I, I'd injured myself and I got some skin issues and I just couldn't see myself training again. I thought I was just going to do like little bits of calisthenics, try and be a sports scientist. And then Harry was still doing it. If Harry wasn't doing it at that time, I don't think I would have got back into MMA after watching John Wick too. I watched John Wick 2 and I saw these judo throws and I think, I kind of want to do that again. But if Harry wasn't doing it at that point, I wouldn't have got back into it, I don't think. Yeah, I think it's fascinating because certainly fighting, in particular, there's so many different family links. Uh, people who, you know, Kalzaghi, um, Kibbe, for example, and, and you could run George June, you could go on and on and on, so many different people who train with their a family member. And it seems to sort of really help them on their on their journey, right? And that's really important what you said there about being honest with each other because in anything really, sport, life, I really genuinely believe that you've got to have the right people around you because invariably we do sort of pick up traits and tendencies from the people we spend time with. Your sports science degree as a professional, a champion within your sport, would you agree with that? It's important the people around you. 100%, 100%. People like to say, you know, it goes back to people wanting to like give themselves credit, which is good, but a lot of people like to say, I'm a self-made man. There's no such thing as a self-made man in martial arts. There is no such thing as a self-made man. You are, you know, you're a product of your own motivations and your own, your own work ethic and all that, but you're a product of the team you're around, 100%. I totally agree with you, Matt. I really, really do. I think it's so important to have the right people around you. So from Middlesbrough Fight Academy, you still represent that gym, is that right? Yeah. Is was is Abdul your coach, is he? Yeah, Abdul Muhammad. Yeah, a good man, a nice man. Yeah. He's yeah. like scary when you first meet him. You see someone that of, of that frame, you know, he's got quite like a, a deadpan kind of temperament. You've got to go down this quite strange alley to get into the gym as well. And it's behind this big green door. It looks like some weird, you're entering some weird compound. But um, I remember when I first started training at Middlesbrough Fight Academy, he asked me my name and I said, George. And he thought I said, Josh. And for six months, I'm like, I- I'm Josh now. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I guess I'm Josh. But he is the, he's the most like, honorable, respectful person ever. It's like if you if you show the respect and work ethic towards him, he pays it back a millionfold. 
Yeah, he's a really nice man. A really, really nice man. A gentleman. Is it important for you to go in to the sport you've gone into, the profession, and have a mentor who was... Because I, I really believe in mentoring. I think it's so important. I think so many issues society has is because, say, for example, we were on about your upbringing, your background, is that lack of a real mentor who will who, who, pave the way with their habits, their behaviours, their conduct, their, the, 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 the moral value deck, I guess. Um, how important for, for you was having a, the right mentor? And do you believe in mentoring? Yeah, I believe in it 100%. I'm, you know, I could have ended up in different gyms and I wouldn't have, you know, won the belt that I've won now. I have been incredibly lucky. When I started, I started Muay Thai and I had Kin, he was a guy called Kin Brian Thawang. He was my teacher in Muay Thai who had like 250 fights, which was just, you know, you don't realize because you're 12 years old, but that's just insanely lucky to have that so close to home to train. And then when I moved to MMA, it's Abdul Muhammad. And again, it's, I've just got to step back and think how incredibly lucky I have, I am to have had these influences in my life. Like would never, wouldn't have rather have started training under anyone else than Abdul Muhammad. He's a, he's a really good man. You know what really seeps through yourself, mate? And I was told this by mutual friends that we've got, including my brother Aaron. It's about yourself and your brother. How humble you are. Um, you seem very, very comfortable within your own skin and who you are. I really commend you for that, mate. And, and you seem, you've you said gratitude and lucky quite a lot of time today, you know. Um, is that important to you, that sort of outlook of, of being grateful and, and actually being humble enough to know I'm quite lucky to be in these positions, etc.? Yeah, it's just, I think everything you have to, you have to approach every situation from like a set of gratitude first. And then that makes you appreciate the opportunity you've got. Like the people around me, like, like I've said this before, when I won the belt, he was training at AKA, the biggest gym in the world. A lot of the people I'm training with, they were, they're coming to the gym, maybe they're 20 minutes late because they've just had a busy job being an electrician or being a firefighter, being a bricklayer, all sorts of these real world hard jobs. And they've come in, maybe they're 10 minutes late, but I'm just so grateful they've come in to help me. And, you know, that's one of the biggest things about winning the belt is it's not about me winning the belt, having like a title attached to my name, whatever you, it's that it's, it's kind of, it's kind of the, the belt is Burroughs. It's, because of the people helping me, they're just real people from Borough, coming from difficult, real-world jobs. You know, they're not training with Hall of Fame UFC fighters. They're coming from these difficult-ass, real-world jobs, still getting to the gym just to push me in these rounds. I can't, I can't describe how grateful I am to have people who will put that effort into me and then how grateful I am for the opportunities to fight. It's if I if I ever feel negative about something, I just have to pull it back that one step, and I think, "Wow, I get to do this. This is this is insane." I'll tell you what, mate. That, I'm going to say thank you to you because that sort of outlook of gratitude you've got, and realism and humility, it's really inspirational. You know, mate. It makes me feel like it's so super cool. Because fighting as well, we're quite heavily influenced through our sports people, our heroes, aren't we? We went sort of through the McGregor stage, I guess, you know, where everyone was quite openly, vocally, um, externally confident, even if they weren't, I'll do this and I'll do that. But what a cool outlook, mate. What a severely cool person, just to say that, like, how grateful you are. How how important is Middlesbrough team, mate, when you represent Middlesbrough and you go out there? Because we're a unique bunch, aren't we? Yeah, it's... You know, even when I've been around the world to fight now, Middlesbrough still has something to it that I can't describe. Still has a character to it I can't describe. And that was the main thing is when I got the belt against such a good opponent from America, from the biggest gym in the world, it was that validation of what can be done. Even in a comparatively small place, it's like the first time I walked back into the gym after that fight and I looked around and it's like, 
you know, our gym has everything you need, but there's an aspect of it's held together by tape. You know, like the cage walls are held together a bit by tape, you know, bits of tape on the mat. But, you know, the mat's a bit lumpy. It's not like some amazing global global gym facility. But it's like, we just have what we need. We have what we need. It's it's all there was a there was a point in the fight in the fight camp for that title fight where things weren't looking great and I didn't feel great about stuff. There wasn't loads of training partners around. There was Ramadan, so a lot of my Muslim training partners were like doing Ramadan and couldn't really like train on the night. They hadn't drank or eaten all day. It's that hot. They couldn't come in and do a hard sparring session on the night. So I didn't have all the training partners. Uh, but I just had to like tie it back. What do I actually need? I have my coach Abdul here. I have my brother Harry. Okay, that's all I need. And then everything else is a bonus. And then over the fight camp, more and more people were getting into training with me. Like it started really low that fight camp. I really appreciate you sharing. I really believe, I agree with you completely. Totally different thing, you know, we're in business, but there's no, no proud of the moment for us when we go in. Sorry, I was like, really, we shouldn't be winning the housing market or the, the, the local economy. And if you come by that to London, but yeah, we found a way sort of to take on these big firms in London and beat them. In no way is that anywhere near the achievement that you've accomplished, but there's something very unique about tea siders, I, I guess a bit like there is with the Irish as well. And if one of us goes, you know, you're back in the man, amount of people that went to watch you even on that night, it was like, wow, how many people actually went? I was watching things that looks um, like we sort of took over. It seemed like we took over the arena and the performance itself, Mick. Can we talk about that the, the fight? Because, like, honestly, what that, that fight there. One of the best fights I've ever seen, and, and just watching it, I was like, "What the? F-? It was it was unbelievable." Did it play out how you how you'd imagined? What, how did you feel during the fight? Did you realize it was such a great fight? How you just slowly but surely with body shots? Just that's from an untrained eye, by the way. It seemed like you just completely only kept on breaking it down bit by bit and kept on walking forward. The nose, it was like the film Warrior of Rocky. We just kept on. It was just fucking brilliant, man. What was it like to be in something like that? And was it as you anticipated throughout the years? See, it's it's funny when you're in the fight, you don't know how entertaining it is because you just you work and you're just on the job. Something that was it was very different to how I expected the fight. Like I was saying before, I built it in my mind where if I have to get up a hundred times, I'll get up off my back a hundred times. If I get if he shoots on me a hundred times, I'll try and defend it a hundred times. But then I didn't expect to take the shots that I took. It's like the threat of the takedown opened up a lot of shots. But you can just feel it. That's that's kind of my approach anyways. I kind of... I'm not like out there and swinging everything, trying to get it done in one. I, I kind of ramp the pace and I'm breaking people, breaking people, breaking people. One of my favourite fighters now is Peter Yan. And it's kind of that sort of approach where it doesn't look like it's the fastest, but then by the end of round two and round three, I'm landing more and more and more shots. And it's just, you get those little signs. I'm kind of just level. And then I was getting those little signs where he was breaking. It wasn't even like the first body shots or first big body shots or anything. It's just little things. Say in the first round, a bit through the second round, maybe I land a shot, but he kind of deflects it. He moves and he gets back to his stance. It's very little things. It's like someone losing a bit of discipline with their stance. Maybe they cross the feet over. Maybe they turn the shoulder slightly and they're not. They don't keep their eyes fully on you. Those are the small signs that someone would break, someone's breaking. And I was getting that subconscious feeling. And it's just, it's, it's a very subconscious thing. One of my coaches, Peter Irvin, was saying that to me before the fight is, one of your best things is you know when someone's breaking and how to ramp it up at just the right amount. Some people see a little chink in someone's armor and they go crazy and miss the opportunity to finish the fight because they've just swung or they've got caught. Whereas one of my features is like, I like to ramp it slowly and steadily. And it, it just kind of built, built like a crescendo. 
that first knockdown, I, I, he was on the floor before I realised. He was like, before I even realised I threw a punch. But it was like the second knockdown where I could feel like the build-up of it. I was starting to land more and more. And I knew it was, knew it was there. Because that was such a long fight camp. It was back-to-back-to-back to back to back with pullouts, really. I was supposed to fight for that in December. I had a hard fight camp for December. Didn't happen. Then for March... Didn't happen, ended up being a catchweight fight. And now for this one, it's kind of like an eight-month fight camp. So it's such just a... It's kind of like the lids on the lids on all the emotional stuff. And then as soon as Mark Goddard put his hands on me to stop the fight, it just went... Pop. All let out like a fucking party popper. Yeah. Can you remember the noise you made? I, was, I, was, I think I was going like... <laughs> I was making all. <laughs> Good morning. Yeah. And your brother runs in the ring, grabs you as well. Yeah, that was, that was one of like that was probably the most emotional part of it. Was when there's the big celebration. You know, I'm getting the belt around me. I've got the belt around. And I look at Harry because we've been in this in day one, and we just and we don't really like show loads of emotion to each other. We're kind of like we're very level level headed people. That's one of the first times I can think where I've just had that flood of emotion around my brother where I just hugged him and fucking cried, cried my eyes out for a bit. Brilliant mess. I remember watching, I think, Jamie Taylor and Michael O'Byrne, Becky O'Byrne, two cracking lads, good, good lads. They were watching it and I was one of hundreds watching on the live and it was just fucking magic, mate. And thank you for doing that for our town and just such an inspirational moment, mate. And, you won so many fans, I think, on that night, mate. And you, you're an absolute gentleman to credit to your family. Right? I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to have met you. Thank you. Thank you, mate. Well, it's just the beginning. The the biggest, beginning. That's, the, that's the funny thing. I was like, as soon as I got back into Cage Warriors, the Cage Warriors belt, you know, it's what I'd go to bed thinking about. I'd want that belt. And then I've had so many fight camps where the belt is just what I'm thinking about. It's not even just training. It bleeds over into everything. There's times where little things where, okay, I could eat that. No, I'm going to, I'm not going to eat that so I can save some more calories before my training sessions or what have you. Oh, I want to play some video games. Mm, I'm going to go to bed half an hour earlier so I'm more fresh tomorrow. It's just like decisions upon decisions upon, upon decisions. It's like tens of thousands of decisions really over the course of a year built up to that. It's like, I'm tired at the end of a session. I've just done loads of wrestling, uh, positional rounds. Well, I'll still get that extra round on the bags in. And it's just thousands and thousands of thousands upon decisions built up to that. But then as soon as it happened, it's like two or three days. I'm like, okay, what's next? I kind of had to force myself to take a longer rest because of little like, niggles and injuries from the fight. My nose was a bit banged up for a while. My hands were hurting so and my foot was hurting. So I'm like, you know what? I've just been fight camp to fight camp to fight camp. I need a little bit of recovery, but that was just what's next. Yes. The, can I ask you a question, please? The man of a champion, the man of a fighter, such a unique group of human beings, right? Who just think so differently. Who's the number one in the world for, you, for your work category right now? Uh... Well, it's Oliveira. Oliveira. Do you ever look at the, him or the, those around that and think, nah, I could never beat that? Or do you think, yeah, I, I belong in that company? And... This, this is not the spot to be in if you don't think you can beat the best in the world. I think there's other, there's other spots where there's not the dire physical consequences where you can play it and you kind of do it recreationally. This is this is a sport where you have to have that belief you can beat anyone. Like I remember, like it was one of the uh, one of the best fights I've seen. It was it was a UFC Fight Night main event, Sarukian versus Gamrot, and it's probably the best fight this year for me. Just the the levels of scrambles in it. I'll watch something like that, and I'll go to bed thinking, when he did that victor roll, how would I ride it? Would I engage with him in that position? How can I stop that body kick? Situations from their fight are playing in my head. So I don't think it 
I don't think it is a sport where you can look at people in your own weight class and think, oh, my, he's so great. You know, I could never see myself in, in there with him. Because you put yourself at too much of a disadvantage. Like putting, totally people on the, putting people on the pedestal. Totally, totally, totally agree, mate. I, again, I think it's something really transferable at life. The only difference is you guys are getting choked. <laughs> Joking out one punch <laughs> by by basically a trained killer, so very very different, I guess. But listen, mate, I, thank you for your time on a Sunday morning. What an absolute honour! I'd love to get your brother on as well and have a chat with him. You're a really 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 good guy, and I have a lot of respect for you. And thank you, mate. Up the borough. Up the fucking borough. Up thank you for your time. Thank you. God bless. Thank you so much, mate. Join the award-winning team at Bespoke Financial, where you get free training in your own time.